Well, it is great to be back at Cal Southern, but no pressure here because I'm one of your peers. I'm a fellow doctoral student here at Cal Southern, so my dean is here and my academic advisor here, <laughs> and some of my mentors are here, so no pressure, no worries. I'm fine. <laughs> So anyway, it actually feels like coming home. You know, I began life in the addiction field, and I'll talk more about this a little later. Whenever I'm asked to speak on this topic, I generally accept because I always discover some new information. And I simply hope that I can help one person today to grow in their understanding of this field of addiction. This is my passion, and it is my purpose. So I want to thank Cal Southern for providing such a wonderful learning environment for me to actualize that. And if I look a little tired, it's because I'm a doctoral student, OK? <laughs> so what are we going to do today? Because we're going to get some CEUs, right? So we want to stay on course with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the current prevalence in the United States of this uh, rate and use of addiction uh, problems. I just want to create a, a picture uh, past, present, and future. I'm going to describe some terms and resources so we can all get on the same page. And remember that today, this little bit of time that I have is just the tip of the iceberg. I want you to know that whatever it is I speak on today, I am not promoting a particular school of thought or a treatment modality. Although, as some of you know, I do have my preferences. So I hope this enhances your self-discovery in the addiction field. So, does this look familiar to anybody? <laughs> the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the sort of the Bible of our field, has created a common language over this cultural change that we've been through. And so let's just start with, what, how are we defining addiction uh, treatment right now? Addiction terminology is, it's a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress. And it must have three or more of these symptoms, tolerance, withdrawals, a large amount of use over longer periods of time and more than intended, and some unsuccessful efforts to cut down, time spent obtaining the substance and replacing that time with some other activities that you might have been doing, or continued use despite adverse effects. Primary chronic neurobiological disease with a genetic, psychosocial, environmental factors influencing its development. And a phrase that I discovered recently that I taught 35 years ago, this disorder is chronic, it's progressive, and if left untreated, it can be fatal. You know, just the other night, CNN was reporting uh, and said that 40 years ago, President Nixon first declared this war on drugs. David Carr was speaking, and he talked about his own recovery. He's a New York Times columnist, and what he said was, today, half of all people incarcerated are there because of drug-related crimes. Today, there is easier access and wider distribution than ever before. Is, you think it's only been 40 years? Well, we're going to see here. So currently, what's this cost of addiction in the United States? $600 billion. The cost is related to crime, loss of productivity, and health care. It's dramatic. This disorder, the $600 billion costly disorder, is, uh, represents a greater economic impact than diabetes, obesity, and smoking put together. Let's take a look at one population, these young adults, let's say ages 19 to 29. There's a heightened risk at this age for substance experimentation and abuse. The prevalence rates for just this age group in substance abuse is two to three times higher than rates seen in adolescence and middle adulthood. These young adults are also have a very high rate of what we call the co-occurring disorder where there's maybe trauma and substance abuse or depression and substance abuse. Let's think about the young adult years for a minute. What are they supposed to be? They're supposed to be intended to be the springboard of adult life. 
of productivity, laying the groundwork for the future. It's a time of passion. I have some young adult sons and inspiration and hope and they know it all, right? <laughs> this group is, has a high incidence of substance abuse and addiction problems. They're losing these critical years. Let's just talk about California for a minute. Estimated 7.41% of people over the age of 18 have alcohol dependence. Now just listen to these numbers for a minute. I wonder if I turned it off. Um, yeah, if you guys want to come up and help it switch, I'll just keep talking, which is no problem for me. <laughs> um, so if there are 28 million people over the age of 18, in California, there are over 2 million suffering from substance abuse. Now, substance abuse admissions totals in California in 2010 were a little over 165,000. Alcohol related admissions, 37, almost 38,000. So, if you do the math, there are a lot of people that need treatment that aren't getting it. So the, the, the moral of the story right now in California is there is a plenty of need for treatment, but the folks are not getting it. The numbers are staggering. So let's look at another population. How about the military? 20 to 25% of active duty military personnel are misusing substances, especially alcohol and prescription drugs. Those exposed to combat develop a new onset of heavy binge drinking and alcohol related problems. Very few are referred to treatment. The, um, when substance abuse and trauma occur together, which is about 13 to 22 percent, uh, there's in what we see is increased aggression, domestic violence, child maltreatment, and increased suicide. And that was a 2007 study. I can guarantee you the numbers are higher now. Let's look at um, uh, a study that was done in 2010, one-third of soldiers take prescription meds. And I bet you can guess what kind of meds those are, painkillers. One-seventh of the Army is currently prescribed an opiate painkiller. One-third of the Army suicides involve prescription drugs. And from 2006 to 2009, the prescription, prescription drugs uh, involved were an estimated in a, almost 139 Army deaths. That's tragic. So is it really only a 40-year battle that we've been looking at? Probably not. Though that was like in the beginning of time an early winery. Look at that, we're crushing grapes. So human beings have had this need in all cultures to change their mind or to alter their state. This isn't new. And a, uh, an excellent professor here at Cal Southern, Dr. Linda Salvucci, did um, a master lecture series called The Addiction Puzzle. And I am happily going to gather some information from her lecture. Dr. Salvucci was instrumental in developing and implementing the addiction courses here at Cal Southern. And she teaches in the doctoral program as well. She has over 30 years of experience and has worked in a variety of inpatient, outpatient, and community environments. And um, I happen to know she's a wonderful professor. Um, because I happen to be a doctoral student here. Um, so after, uh, if you want, I'll, the, um, uh, in the master lecture series, if you look up Dr. Linda Salvucci, the um, information is in a lecture called The Addiction Puzzle. So at the beginning of time in the Stone Age, we were eating mushrooms for the mental and hallucinogenic experiences. 10,000 BC, brewing beer. And it was said that beer was on the table before bread. Now, there was no celebrity rehab back in the day, so Alexander the Great drank himself to death at 33 years old. In the 19th century, alcohol and drugs were being used for medicine. However, the alcohol content was 95%. I bet a lot of people were going to their doctors. So the, what do you think? The first war on drugs was probably around 1840 with the first temperance movement. Five million people got politically involved in this movement to get rid of what was called the demon rum. The demon rum. Now, women, you know that we like to rally around really important things. And we like to get active. And we know what to use to uh, get our message across. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. 
So women use what they have to to get the message across, right? Was this wonderful? How about these slogans from the temperance movement? Drinking leads to neglect of duty, moral degradation, and crime. Now they don't say abuse, they just say drinking. I mean, they were saying the whole thing was bad. Now here's my favorite, and I'm really sorry if I offend anybody, but I couldn't resist this one. It says beer, for those of you, if you can see it. Helping ugly people have sex since 1862. Uh, sorry, I hope I don't get docked for that one. <laughs> So whether it was the temperance movement or later on, when people help people, recovering alcoholics have influenced public policy for many decades. Now here's a little bit of history that some of you may know. In 1935, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson started talking with each other. Actually, I learned that they started talking in 1934, but Dr. Bob relapsed. And so, when they talked in 1935, that was the date that Alcoholics Anonymous was born in his sustained recovery. And then in 1951, the World Health Organization acknowledged alcoholism as a medical problem. In the same year, the Minnesota model of treatment used professionals combined with AA for accelerated recovery. In 1956, the American Medical Association, the AMA, said that alcoholism is a treatable disease. And then in the 1960s, Dr. Jelnick developed a comprehensive model of the disease of alcoholism. And so as you can see, things are evolving in our culture about this problem with addiction. In 1968, the Department of Defense knew about the widespread use of marijuana with the Vietnam soldiers. They did a study of 930 soldiers coming back through, I think it was Oakland, and this was in regards to heroin use. 16% of this returning group of 930 admitted to use. 10% re admitted to repeated use. This is of heroin. And four, over 4% 4 admitted to daily use in the past month. So who's coming home for more? In 1970, Senator Harold Hughes, a recovering alcoholic himself, spearheaded a legislation called the Comprehensive Act. This was stating that addiction is a major health problem. And in 1974, and I'll talk about this more in a little bit, uh, NADAC was established, which was an organization developed to, of qualified and professional addiction services personnel. Agencies continue to evolve. In 1978, the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers was birthed. And this was an organization to provide leadership, advocacy, and training, and other member support services. In 92, SAMHSA, which if you're in this field, you'll learn a lot about SAMHSA. It is one of the most um, comprehensive res resources that we have. So please go on their website when you want to find either lay people or professionals can gather a great deal of information. They, um, they're from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and they lead the public health efforts into the advancement of behavioral health for the nation. Now that's so that substance abuse and mental health. The certifying bodies evolved, and NADAC in 1978, as I said, was born, and they are a professional organization. And in 1967, here in LA and San Diego County, a group called CARD, Counselors on Alcoholism and Related Disorders, was developing and taught courses at UCLA. In about 1980, and Alan Johnson will speak to more of this later, CARD developed into getting some national recognition, and in 1984, it was transitioned into what we now know as KDAC. And in 2007, KDAC was named one of 10 certifying organizations by the Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs. Yay, California. We're called a lot of things, right? But <laughs> we have KDAC. So these many faces of addiction really do require many forms of treatment. Whether it's celebrities, babies born with fetal alcohol syndrome, or those in the midst of horrific withdrawals, we need a comprehensive form of treatment. These many faces of addiction also require many forms of recovery. In other words, there's not a one-size-fits-all kind of treatment. And if you leave with something today, I really want you to go from a tunnel vision of what we used to think addiction treatment was to a much broader view. 
So there's men, women, students, working professionals. No one is immune from this disease. The treatment efforts need to be comprehensive and flexible. Now, back in the day, which would be back in my day, about 35 years ago, when I started addiction treatment, that kind of looks like me, but not really. It's just how I felt. <laughs> um, then it was the counselor was the one-stop shop treatment approach. Now the counselor could have been an MFT, it could have been a recovering person with no training, it could have been everything in between. And that counselor did interventions, I've done hundreds, in the street, in a hospital, in a home. And the counselor was the treatment provider, running the groups, doing one-on-ones, and the relapse prevention specialist, and the family program specialist, and the aftercare um, specialist. So we were also told some odd 30 years ago not to talk about trauma to the recovering person. And certainly don't even attempt to treat it until they're, remember what we were told? A year clean and sober. So we did what we were supposed to. However, now, all these decades later, people are getting the help that they need, not just the help that a one provider can provide. So now what's called best practice is an interdisciplinary approach to treatment with collaborative use of diverse and different treatment professionals. And now it is standard thinking that we get to treat the co-occurring disorders from the get-go immediately to assess for potentially other disorders, whether it be depression, trauma, PTSD, or other problems. Remember, this is a neurobiological disease. It has genetic implications, psychosocial implications, environmental factors. So we need to develop a team of treatment, which could include interventionists that really specialize in that and getting people to treatment. Then we have specialists who are intake counselors. What they do, I mean, their best job is to do that quick, thorough assessment from the very beginning. It's a very important time to get information. The recovery counselors that are working inpatient and outpatient, we might have social workers, medical doctors for detox or maintaining medications or other health problems, and the therapists for individual and family therapy, life coach, acupuncture, academic and career counseling. Can you see? When we treat the whole person, we need a whole team. Now SAMHSA tried to help the direction of this and helping providers look at what they call the four quadrant framework. And this was especially used for these co-occurring disorders. So this four quadrant framework was developed to help providers organize the range of services. Um, so the first quadrant would be where a provider might speak to another provider in an informal way. Maybe a release is signed and two uh, providers are talking. And this is when both disorders maybe are a little less severe. Quadrant two and three is about collaboration where one disorder, either the substance abuse or maybe the mental health disorder, is more severe than the other. And it's a more formal relationship where the treatment regimen is defined and ongoing contact is made between the providers. Now quadrant four is what SAMHSA calls the integrated services where both disorders are more severe and the team needs to come together in a fashion. So quadrant one might, in, in my business, and I have a private practice business outpatient, might look like uh, this last week I had a referral from a psychiatrist and she's, uh, the patient is in her 50s, long time prescription drug problems, a wonderful woman, retired nurse, well, retired because her addiction took her job away. Um, and the psychiatrist and I Skyped. Now he's providing Suboxone, he's providing medical treatment, he has seen her for a very long time in and out of treatment, and now I'm the new counselor on the block. So the fact that we could Skype together and we're in separate places early in treatment was really, really wonderful. And it really helped us come together. And it was, even though it was sort of informal, um, it was really helpful and the patient felt very respected that all of her providers are getting on the same page together. I also think it's a much more efficient model than being out there by yourself. Many of you have heard what's called evidence-based treatments. This is the um, designation through SAMHSA, and this is what it means. It means if a practice is evidence-based, it practices the effect 
effectively integrated and best research evidence available. It has cultural competence and the values of the person receiving the services is considered. These programs or practices will have consistent scientific evidence showing improved outcomes for clients, participants, and communities. So best practices are based in research. There's been some outcome measures. It's been approved. It's culturally sensitive. And think about this for a moment, though. In all the addiction treatment over the years, has everything we've done been evidence-based? No. Things have to get to be evidence-based. So why would uh, treatment want to be evidence-based? Well, partly because it puts it on the map, it gets funding, third-party reimbursement. There are some reasons that it's good to have an evidence-based practice um, for addiction because it's been shown through the research that it's effective. However, I want you to keep an open mind because practices take time to become evidence-based in the qualifications. So don't wait. Keep practicing. Um, and you have access to this PowerPoint, which is why I put these website addresses in it so that you, it'll be easier for you. Where do you find these evidence-based practices? SAMHSA, again, on their website, and it describes what they are. There's a National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, and there's hundreds of them. Um, and the evidence-based practices database there's a, uh, in, out of Washington. So these are simply some resources to make it easy for you to get there. So one example in a Cal Southern Master Lecture Series uh, by Catherine Whitaker uh, of the evidence-based integrated model for addiction is called the Matrix Model. Again, fellow students, it's a wonderful lecture. And it, it combines this Matrix Model for Addiction four-month program of cognitive behavioral therapy, m motivational interviewing, contingency management, the 12-step facilitation, and family therapies. So as you can see, matrix is what it means. It means this integrated approach, pulling evidence-based practices together to treat the addiction. So when we treat trauma, which we are now evidence-based allowed to do, it's a good idea to treat it earlier than later, it's now common knowledge that we do that because what happens when untreated trauma is fueling a substance problem. It's what we call the vicious cycle, and I could do, I hesitate to say this because <laughs> my dean is sitting in front of me. It's a whole lecture in and of itself, <laughs> okay? The vicious cycle of addiction and trauma. And so when trauma is fueling addiction and addiction is fueling trauma, if you don't treat both disorders at the same time, um, it's just not, simply not gonna work. Recent research, research shows that an integrated trauma and substance abuse treatment is associated with substance use reduction. What this means to me is that I can start treating the trauma even if somebody's not clean and sober yet. And this was blasphemy back in the day, okay? So some of the ways that um, we get to do this is another evidence-based treatment is called seeking safety. Um, Lisa Najavitz out of a grant, Anida grant back in 1992 developed this really pretty incredible psychoeducational program. And it's just one example of how an integrated treatment program combines behavioral, interpersonal, case management, uh, and clinical processes. If you, again, it's a lot to go into is the Seeking Safety program, but it's really an excellent uh, trauma and substance abuse treatment um, method. And then there's another one that I happen to really love because I've been doing it for about 20 years now. That's called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Now, EMDR is an evidence-based treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. What that means is it's been approved um, by the Veterans Association uh, and it's in the top three treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. So that doesn't mean it's an evidence-based treatment for addiction yet. However, those of us who've been trained in EMDR have been using it with our addicted um, clients for many, many years. So I'm, EMDR is a comprehensive integrated treatment method. It's not a technique. The first controlled research study on EMDR was done in 1986. It's based on, a, in neuroscience, the adaptive information processing system. And I guess I could say this again, this is a whole lecture in and of itself. So I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg if you haven't heard of EMDR. 
It's conducted only by licensed certified therapists to ensure patient safety and fidelity of the therapy. It focuses on past, present, and future, and it is an eight-step protocol. So it's been, what we've done in the addiction field with EMDR is in using this trauma processing model, what we've found is it influences urge reduction and relapse prevention. How exciting is that? Um, there was a study in 2000, or 1998 with veterans, 12 sessions of EMDR, it eliminated diagnosed PTSD in 77.7% .7 of the multiply traumatized veterans. 100% treatment retention. We can't help folks if they don't stay, right? The effects maintained were measured three and nine months out and they stuck, which is very cool. So when trauma is resolved, it breaks that vicious cycle of the self-medication and then the addiction has a much greater chance of being resolved as well. An innovative use of EMDR with addiction was um, a research project I got involved in um, in the early 2000s. It was supposed to be a two-year federal grant that we got to integrate EMDR and seeking safety into a drug court program. The EMDR therapists in the area that we contacted to be a part of this study were very excited to bring EMDR into this population. And um, the challenge was it was in Washington State in Olympia in the Thurston County Drug Court and we lived in San Diego. So we were up and down the um, West Coast a lot. But let me tell you that, again, evidence-based is where we're all headed. And yet, integrating treatment methods that we see work in our offices, in our practices, in our organizations is worth trying in a population that might not have otherwise um, gotten the treatment. So very quickly, I will just tell you, in combining EMDR and Seeking Safety, Seeking safety in the drug court for this um, time frame was required for those who had anything close to subthreshold PTSD. EMDR was voluntary after they completed the Seeking Safety program. What we discovered is almost twice as many drug courts participants graduated from the EMDR group as the two other groups, and the two other groups were program as usual and Seeking Safety only. So when we combined, integrated this treatment of EMDR and seeking safety, graduation rates went up. Now what does that mean in drug court? If you can keep them, you can have a better chance of healing them. Retention rates in the drug court population, graduation rates have to do with su success rates. So why did we take this two-year project and nine years later, <laughs> we finally gave it some closure, although it's continuing in the drug court? because of people like Tommy. Tommy was in drug court nine times over many years. Nobody had asked him about his trauma history. Nobody had assessed him for PTSD. Nobody usually did that back in the day in drug court. So Tommy, as you can see on the left, was a pretty typical drug court is nonviolent, first time felony drug abusers. And um, Tommy was pretty typical. There's a high recidivism rate. When we began to assess for trauma when they first come into the drug court and then provided trauma-based services and treatment, well, you can see, because pictures really speak, Tommy got his life back, his job, his home, his children, and he became an asset to the community and actually spoke to the issues of the co-occurring disorders of substance abuse and trauma. So. Be creative, integrate things of that you know that work. Another example is what I call in my business and my company, Coherence Associates, we call it Journey to Wholeness. It's an outpatient uh, individual and group formats. So either people who are thinking they need to be in recovery or have just been into treatment, it's what we call um, an integrated approach. And its purpose is to really strengthen somebody's recovery. And what we're doing at Coherence Associates in the Journey to Wholeness program is combining heart math tools, which are stress reduction tools, EFT, which is a in-the-moment stress reduction tool, and these are evidence-based treatments, 
and this is for stabilization and early in treatment. And then we combine seeking safety for safe coping skills and learning about this disorder of trauma and substance abuse. And then we add the EMDR for the trauma processing. And we call that journey to wholeness. So 40 years later, what have we learned? Well, we've learned that wonderful people can end up with a terrible disorder. We've learned that this is a complicated neurobiological disorder, not a problem of will or character. We've learned that this medicalization of the addiction industry gives us a same language where we all can come from, and it sets some industry standards. We've learned that evidence-based treatments are making headway. They, they must be, we're being required by this evidence-based movement to really answer to our therapeutic interventions and to, and to measure our outcomes, and that's a good thing. And the goal of treatment and addiction is to live a meaningful life without the need of alcohol and drugs, and there's no one clear model. So what else have we learned? We've learned that this medicalization of this industry does influence third-party reimbursements, but it can cause us to look at a person as a cluster of symptoms rather than a whole person. These evidence-based treatments are not only effective treatments, um, but they're not the only effective treatments. It, um, it's sort of like in the days of penicillin, it, they found out that it worked, but they didn't know why for a really long time. We knew that EMDR, in, you know, when we were rolling up our sleeves in the early years, we knew it worked, we could see it, but we didn't know why. And so don't wait. If you have a model that seems to be working, make it, you know, keep using it, but then go ahead and start measuring some of the outcomes so that it can potentially become an evidence-based treatment. And we've also learned that comprehensive treatment is not the one size fits all. We really have to integrate uh, many treatment modalities. So in an interview from our infamous Tom Delner, the great interviewer, um, when he interviewed Dr. Linda Salvucci, um, it, it, this is what uh, Dr. Salvucci said. She said, I think it's extremely important for students to form their own belief systems and to come to terms with their perspective. These core beliefs will ultimately inform how they will treat their patients. The curriculum in the addiction program is what she's referring to, is designed not only to teach students about addiction, but to help them form and embrace these fundamental beliefs, which I think is absolutely critical for those who want to practice in this field. So Dr. Salvucci reminds us in this interview that addiction remains a complicated and controversial disorder. It affects every aspect of life of a person. And our own lives as providers um, really influences our choices and how we see others and how we learn and how we grow. When I said I was born into this field, I wasn't kidding. My parents struggled with this disorder. And I mentioned earlier that as a, um, being born into this field and knowing and watching my parents struggle, as a teenager, I watched my father go to treatment and find his AA family, and then come home to become the man and father he was meant to be. Who would have thought 40 years later I know I'm going to get through this. My son, who got the genetic loading and struggled for many years, asked me to give him his first year token at an AA meeting. I stood up in front of over 300 people in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and thanked them for bringing my father and my son home so that they might be the men that they were meant to be. My perspective has been influenced by my life. People in my family and so many clients over the decades I've been in practice have given me the hope that this disease is treatable. People do recover. The success rates, though, are still way too low. And we need more trained professionals to help improve this. This disorder is still taking too many lives. Many of us have been a witness to this. You know, two weeks, years ago, two weeks into my son's uh, sobriety, we sat at a funeral of a relative who struggled for decades and finally lost the battle. As a mother of a newly sober young adult son, I was terrified at this funeral, listening to the stories of many recovering people who maintained their struggles. 
As a newly sober person, my son sat next to me, equally terrified of this disease. If this person had lost their battle to cancer, we would have experienced this service differently. There is still a destructive stigma in our culture about this addiction disorder, and that's very unfortunate. This disorder is complicated and it affects a person in all areas of their lives. We must continue to treat it comprehensively and compassionately. All of us are impacted in some way in our homes, in our communities. We don't get to skip this disease. Not just, and not just providing the help that you're trained in, but allowing a person to have treatment from a variety of places. Addiction's not going away. We can't win this war on drugs. It's never ending, as you could see. However, we can find compassionate and effective solutions to treat the problems of addiction. Now, if you do have a desire to make a difference through the addiction treatment, it's really worth all the coursework, all the hours, because you only have to do that once. However, you will be a lifetime learner, and you will make a difference in someone's life. And if you're interested, this program at Cal Southern is top of the line. And in California, we have some of the highest standards of excellence in the addiction treatment field. So one person can make a difference. Dr. Bob, Bill Wilson, Senator Hughes, and you. Together, we can create change for future generations.